path would be for rapamycin or any similar drug. It doesn't have to be, it could be a rapalog, um, to, to be available to humans in a way where they could choose to take it. Um, yeah. And so, I mean, suppose it's two years later, three years later, you know, the dog trial has been going amazingly well and we feel this is, so what would be the next steps and, and how would you see the path where we would be able to get rapamycin and have approved, I guess. Yeah. So, and and I'll um, I'll I'll talk a little bit maybe more generally here, and not mm. so much specifically about rapamycin, because I think there are multiple paths that this could go down, right? Mm. Uh, depending on the intervention. So, so the first question is: Is it a regulated drug? Uh, rapamycin, of course, is. You know, there's lots of stuff that people are already selling that that might or might not have any effects on on healthy aging that aren't regulated. So. So you could make the argument that some of these things are already available. We just don't know if they work, right? NAD precursors are a good example, right? You can go buy NMN or, or nicotinamide riboside right now if you want to. We just have no clue if they actually do anything or if you're throwing your money away. That's the problem, in my view, with the unregulated supplements. There's no incentive for people to actually do the rigorous experiments to, to figure out whether they work. So nobody does the experiments and we don't know. Um, but that is one path. Uh, another path is to get FDA approval for some indication um, so that a physician can prescribe it for you. And actually rapamycin and metformin, those are two, two drugs that people talk a lot about that are regulated. Right now, you can, you, if you can convince your physician to prescribe it to you, you can take those molecules now. There are a lot of people taking metformin for healthy aging because they've been able to convince their physician that, 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 it's, that the risk reward profile favors reward. Um, less people taking rapamycin through that path because there's more concern about side effects as we've already talked about. But it, but the barrier, there is no barrier right now mm. if you can convince a physician to prescribe it to you to taking those, those drugs. Um, I think what would be likely to see these things go more mainstream where most physicians would feel comfortable prescribing these, these medications for healthy aging um, would be if there was FDA approval for an age-related indication. And this is the real, I think, bottleneck at this point. How do you get a drug through clinical trial, FDA approved for, not for a disease, but for healthy aging, for, for preventing a disease or reversing a functional decline? And this is where there's a lot of activity in the field right now. People are trying different strategies. So one strategy is, is the approach uh, that's being taken by the targeting aging with metformin or TAME trial, where you try to categorize you know, multiple different age-related diseases as one thing. And then you look at the time it takes for people to go from having one age-related disease to having two age-related diseases and ask if metformin or whatever your intervention is can increase that length of time. So that's a comorbidity trial. It's not a healthy aging trial exactly, but it, the, the concept is to take multiple age-related diseases and treat them as one endpoint. The approach that I favor is more akin to what RestorBio Restor tried to do, which is to pick a functional measure of aging that we know declines with age and show that your intervention can improve that. And so their functional measure of aging was uh, vaccine response. We know that vaccine response goes down with age. They asked if we treat with, with the rapamycin derivative for six weeks, can we get a better vaccine response? And they did. Um, they ultimately were unsuccessful in their phase three clinical trial. That's a complicated story there were at least two things that went on there. And we can talk about that if you're interested, but that approach I think is a viable approach. And there are multiple functional measures of aging that you could consider that would fall into that sort of a, a paradigm. So there's immune function, there's cognitive function. You could look at people with mild cognitive impairment, see if you can either prevent the decline to Alzheimer's disease or maybe even improve cognitive function. Um, you could look at a variety of functional measures. Heart function would be another one, kidney function, right? We know these things decline with age. Can you see either a delay in further decline or at least with rapamycin, there's some evidence it can actually make things better. So I think that's sort of the second approach to FDA approval that is that is viable. None of these things are easy though. And one of the reasons why they're not easy, aside from the fact that clinical trials are hard and expensive, um, is that FDA doesn't really know how to deal with a clinical trial 
aimed at targeting aging in health, quote unquote, healthy older people. I don't like, I don't really don't like that term, healthy older people, because I think it leads to the misconception that older people are functionally the same as younger people, and they're not. We absolutely know that. Almost any functional measure of health you look at, a 70 year old is not gonna function as well as a 20 year old. So there are declines in function that are a part of normal aging that lead to impaired health in my view. So I sort of, I sort of prefer thinking about um, health status as normal health status for your age, but you're not the same as you were 40 years ago. And so FDA hasn't really wrapped their minds around how to deal with clinical trials in this space. And so there's a lot of discussion back and forth about you know, what is the acceptable risk in a 65 year old person of normal health status versus the potential reward. I think the reward is obvious, right? We know that that 65 year old person with very known statistics has high risk of developing one or more age related diseases over the next decade. And there's a pretty good chance they're gonna die. So there's a lot of risk there or a lot of, a lot of potential reward if we can delay that or reverse it. But what level of risk is acceptable in a 65 year old person of normal health status? That is where the clinical world I think has not um, has not really gotten to the point where they 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 understand uh, that 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 there should be some tolerance of risk for the potential reward. Right, and the thing is, it's not at the moment. It's difficult. It's like it's not my choice. It's like I have to convince a doctor that it's. Yeah, that it's, that I agree. It's a good I choice. think and this is it's a challenge. Um, and I don't know where the right you know where the right balance is. I think for people who are you know, relatively educated about, about the information in this space, you can make a pretty good decision about what you, what's, your, what's your tolerance for risk and reward. My feeling is that where the regulatory agencies are gonna, are gonna come down is that most people are not informed enough to make that decision themselves. Uh, and so the regulatory body needs to step in to, and, and the physicians whose role it is to, to guide people on, on health need to step in. I think what's unfortunate, and again, this will just take time, is that the clinical community, generally speaking, and this is a generalization, um, physicians are quite conservative when it comes to allowing people to make choices about their own health when it involves introduction of risk. Uh, and so I think there needs to be discussion in this area around what the risks are of doing nothing for older people. And again, I think we all intuitively know what the risks are. If we do nothing, your patient is going to get sick and die. We can't say exactly when, but it's gonna happen with 100% certainty. So if we can keep them healthier longer and help them live longer in a healthy state, there should be some tolerance for risk. But I think that discussion has not permeated the clinical community yet. Right. No, I get that. Um, so very briefly, so you did mention that you could talk a little bit more about this. I, I guess it was the immune trial where, because yeah. I, I would be interested to see, because that seems like some way that people can um, can use rapamycin to improve their immunity, which would be a, a very useful thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 so the background here is that um, there was a company uh, that, so, so Novartis originally got the patent on Everolimus, which is just a, you can think of it as, as exactly like rapamycin. It's a chemical derivative of rapamycin called a rapalog, but it functions mechanistically, biochemically exactly the same way, just has a little bit different bioavailability. So Novartis had the rights to Everolimus. They licensed it to this company, Restore Bio, who was developing it for this immune indication, vaccine response indication. They did two um, clinical trials, phase two clinical trials. In both trials, uh, Everolimus enhanced vaccine response. And then in the second trial also protected against other respiratory tract infections um, over the next year. Hmm. In the second trial, they introduced another drug called RTB101 or Dactolacib, which is a different kind of mTOR inhibitor. So just like rapamycin, it inhibits mTOR, but it does it through a different mechanism, uh, through a catalytic site inhibition. And um, and they introduced the second drug and there are a variety of explanations for why they did it. I'm not gonna get into to trying to, to figure out exactly why they did that, 
but they introduced the second drug in the second phase two trial. And for reasons that I personally think are still a little bit unclear, when they moved to this phase three trial, they took out Everolimus and only went with this other mTOR inhibitor, RTB101. So that is one difference between the two phase two trials that were successful and the phase three trial that wasn't. The other problem with the, the phase three trial is that, and, I, and here's where I think FDA really messed up. FDA changed the endpoint on the phase three trial from laboratory confirmed infections. So where you actually do a test and you say, yes, this person had an infection to, um, I don't remember exactly what the term is, but basically it was, whether the how the patients felt, whether they felt like they were sick. And their argument, this is my understanding now, you really should talk to Joan Manick, she could probably give you the inside scoop. My understanding is that FDA's argument for, for making that change in the endpoint was that it's important how patients feel, which I agree, it is important how patients feel. So they decided that this patient derived metric of health, how they felt was what the endpoint would be. The problem with that is that we all know there is a such thing as placebo effect. Mm. And so if you don't do laboratory confirmed diagnosis and you go by what the how the patient thinks they feel, it just creates a whole lot of noise. And so, so it certainly is, I have heard Joan argue that, that one of the reasons why this clinical trial was unsuccessful was because of the noise associated with how the patients felt as opposed to whether or not they really had an infection. And that if you look at just the laboratory confirmed infections, there's at least some evidence that the, that, that the drug was successful. So um, again, this is one of the challenges with going into a clinical trial in a completely new space, right? FDA is still figuring out how they're gonna handle this and it runs the risk that they're gonna mishandle it. And you know what, what could have turned out to be a watershed moment in the field, a successful clinical trial for healthy aging turned into an unsuccessful clinical trial, potentially because FDA changed the endpoint in a way that you know, really makes no sense if you think about placebo effect and what placebo effect is. So, it's a, it's a complicated story. Uh, I believe that they're going to publish the data from that clinical trial at some point, even though it didn't hit the endpoint. And then we'll all be able to actually look at the data. So I'm talking from my understanding of what happened. Um, uh, certainly, they left out the, the rapamycin derivative. That much is clear. You know, this thing about FDA changing the endpoint is true. Whether that affected the outcome of the trial it is unclear at this point. Thank you all for watching. I hope that you found the video informative. Please do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button for new video release notifications. It encourages us to continue to create more videos about anti-aging and extending healthy lifespan. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and we'll speak to you again soon.